Now it's our turn to, uh, sorry for the words, but put our balls on the table. Remember, kids, this is not how you play hockey. It's just ugly. I like it. Hey, you guys. I'm doing this. You know what? I love ice cream, too. <laughs> Go back to Canada, Guy Lafleur. Game on! Yeah, game on! Hello and welcome into another edition of the Hockey Show Playoff Edition. Last time we spoke, Ryan, I'm JJ, here's Ryan. The playoffs weren't going on. Now we've had a whole week of playoffs. How are you enjoying them so far? Man, I feel like I if you could OD on hockey, I feel like that's me. I just crawl onto the couch at, you know, 5 o'clock and just put on whatever NBC channel that I can locate and, uh, you know, go from there. So I've been binging some playoffs. Yeah, I think uh, you'd be crazy not to with how good they've been so far, right? I mean, a lot of unpredictable stuff happened in game ones all across the league, I think, except for the Avalanche. That was pretty predictable. But yeah, just a lot of good hockey going on, a lot of great playoffs. Of course, we got to start our show like we do every day, matinee money. Today, I'm going with Tampa Bay money line. I know it's kind of dumb to say that now because it's already a five to one game, but I went heavy on this one just because I knew Tampa Bay wasn't going to lose back-to-back games. They lost, they lost a two-goal lead in the last game. Up there, They were up 5-3, ended up losing in overtime. I'm just like, in my head, Tampa Bay's not doing that again. If if Could you imagine if Florida could come back, this game's half over, if Florida could come back and pull this off, I, I would be like, I got to redo all my brackets and everything because yeah. this is insanity. And Well, that's the thing is going into the playoffs, I actually thought Florida had a really good chance of beating them. I even picked florida to beat tampa bay what i forgot to take into account the return of steven stamkos the return of nikita kucherov both of those guys not only uh, obviously big presence on the uh, team but just producing too they've been scoring left and right and their power play has been super dangerous i mean kucherov is like i missed the whole regular season but guess what i'm (laughs) super strong russian man scores two goals unreal just looks unreal For a guy who missed the entire regular season. Right, and especially in this crazy COVID season, what an ideal scenario, right? I mean, he he probably is just in love with the fact that he did that. Like, why can't I do this every year? Just next year, how about you guys call me once the playoffs are ready to go and and we'll get these things going? I picked, uh, yeah, I picked Tampa Bay to win in seven in my bracket challenge, so. Looking like it's probably going to be five. Yeah, probably going to be five there. I also picked Colorado in seven because I thought a a little more highly of the St. Louis Blues, apparently, but we'll see. How about the the late games that they've been hitting us with? I mean, especially here in Colorado, the game two didn't even start till 845 the other night. Uh, I hate it. That's the worst. I hate it because you're sitting there in the third period like, why am I so tired? (laughs) Oh, because it's like tomorrow. Right. I'm still... Still trying to recover from that, I would say. I'm playing a little guilty because I was playing in a hockey tournament over uh, over the weekend. It's still the weekend. I have a game after this, actually, so that's fun. So do I. Most embarrassing moment of my hockey career, maybe. I was on my way to score my first hat trick ever, heading into an empty net, and it was like a cartoon. You could have heard the whoop, and I just fell feet straight up in the air over my head, and I had to pass it to a teammate to bury the uh, empty netter. Absolutely. <laughs> That's exactly how it felt. That's like some Eric Decker running down the uh, field in a Broncos game wide open and then just getting shot by a sniper going down. It was just like that. I, you know, in my defense, I had a little bit of Crown Royal during the uh, second intermission. So uh, I Listen, think that's to blame. We all know that ice snakes are real and they'll jump out and get you at any time. You have to be prepared for it. Hey, I'm an entertainer, right? I had to entertain the fans that were there watching. I got a good laugh. and There weren't fans. There, be honest. there were a couple. There were a couple. <laughs> I, I've been so bad. For a, for a long time, I had stopped shooting wrist shots and mostly was taking slap shots or little snappers. So I've kind of forgotten how to shoot a, a wrist shot. And having been off the ice for 14 months, I have had some really bad shots. I tried to have this kind of like a stop shoot one timer situation, and it was so pathetically sad. The shot, and I was like, I want everybody to know I shot that as hard as I could, but it was <laughs> just like trickling down the ice. I've been there too, just trying to get your game back since COVID. I mean, stick handling around the apartment just doesn't do it for you. It doesn't do the same as stick handling on the ice, right? Believe it or not, playing NHL 20 and Call of Duty for 14 months has not helped my uh, stick handling. (laughs) We've got a couple good guests for you today. We got John Forslund of NBC and soon to be the Kraken. Um, 
where he's going to join us in PP1. Then we got Mark Mosier to continue breaking down the Avs Blues series with us in PP2. We've got both of your feeds of this Avs Blues series covered, whether you're watching the home feed because you're one of the chosen few or whether you're watching the NBC feed. We've got both sides. Right. It's a little tough for us right now doing a hockey show during the playoffs. You know, I don't know if many people are deciding to listen to us over the Tampa Bay uh, Florida game, but that's the great thing about this show is we have so many ways you can listen to us, right? You can do the replay on any podcast provider and new YouTube channel that we kicked off last week, and it was awesome. I loved it. Great I'd give you the quality. link, but there's a bunch of random letters and numbers <laughs> in it, so I can't. But you can find the hockey show. It's one of 100 the hockey shows on YouTube. I mean, if you're really desperate to to listen to us during the, the Florida g- battle game, we could open the door here, and I could try and do play-by-play in between our thoughts. I don't know. I don't know if you have the what it takes to do play-by-play, but I think that might be illegal. Oh, that's fair. Oh, there you go. Damn Danny, it, Danny. Damn it, Danny. Danny's got our back. Um, let's get into the conversation that I think dominated the Avalanche world this week, right? And that's the hit from Nazem Kadri in Game Two that now he's suddenly received an eight-game suspension for. What's your take on the hit? What's your take on the punishment? My take on the hit was, what are you doing? And then maybe it's uh, the product of a little. Uh, circumstance, you know, like poorly timed, but it was ugly. The the NHL doesn't want that hit in the game. You knew a suspension was coming, period. Full stop. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did not anticipate eight games. I think that is a little obscene. Maybe they aimed high knowing he would appeal. Uh, The last I had seen, Pierre Lebrun from The Athletic said that they were considering all their options uh, and hadn't decided yet, but I can't imagine he wouldn't appeal it was weird to me that it took so long for them to have the hearing like two days and then they didn't even announce it until the game was already During underway the game. so like you knew he wasn't going to play he didn't dress but like what what took so long to decide on that i'm not sure i'm not sure i mean the nhl department of player safety right now doesn't seem to have consistency anywhere right i mean uh, they made everybody mad a couple of weeks ago with Tom Wilson, and then you had a Dmitry Orlov hit last night that apparently isn't getting any sort of uh, meeting or hearing from the Department of Player Safety. So, you know, it's a little weird what's going on uh, on that and front. And there's the Tyson Joes play on Bortuzzo, and I don't necessarily think it was an intentional elbow to the face, but it was an elbow to the face kind of situation, you know? And it's not something where I'm like, okay, this deserves to be a suspension, but, you know, it maybe deserved to be a penalty at the time. And when I look at the Orlov hit, I only saw it once and I was stopped at a stoplight and I was trying to get all my notes and thoughts together. I don't see it being on the same plane of existence as Kadri's hit in that, yes, Orlov jumped. Yes, it was a high hit, but I'm not sure that he necessarily hit him in the face as much as he hit his head on the ice and got hurt. You know, it was a high hit. And like I said, I only saw it one time in a little like video on uh, Twitter. So uh, we'll see. But I think Kadri's hit, it's just it's something that the NHL wants out of the game. And so it's going to be a suspension regardless. Right. I mean, it was he was going so fast, right? And he just came out of nowhere. And I don't think Falk even saw him coming, even in his peripherals. So I think that's the biggest issue is just the speed and the inability of the guy who took the hit to protect himself. I think that's really the biggest thing. So, and yeah. I think I had a fan tweet me and they're like, does he qualify as a repeat offender or not under the NHL's definition? Right. And that's the weird thing about this. Is this it technically high, high, he doesn't, he right? does not. Yeah. And this, this punishment acts as if he does like this. If, if there's a, a tier scale and let's say he's at tier three or four after the hit, right. Well, tier three would have happened, what, two playoffs, three playoffs ago, you know? So, and he hasn't really done anything like this in the regular season that I can think of. So it's a little weird to me. And I, I hate to keep bringing this Tom Wilson situation up, but, you know, what they determined was post scrum regularness for the NHL was Tom Wilson grabbing Artemi Panarin by the hair and ripping him down (laughs) helmetless onto his head, onto the ice, right? Like if, if that's the potential for a head injury, which it was, and you're ruling out this as a head injury, like how does Tom Wilson get away with a fine, but then Kadri gets the book thrown at him. And even Doug Armstrong, GM of the St. Louis Blues, is saying there needs to be some sort of consistency here. Like he wasn't a fan of the Bortuzzo-Jost situation, but there's a, a lot of like, 
well, how come this one is like way up here and this one isn't even considered? And then you're handing out all these fines for other things. Like it's Rami Bean, who is who is on the local news here, tweeted, you know, there needs to be some sort of consistency among these kinds of decisions. And I tweeted back. I was like, it'll never happen. It will never happen. There's just no way for them to categorize the, the scale. I don't know what it is, but there's, it's, you, you never know what's going to come down. Hey, nice to see you're paying attention to the avalanche, right? I mean, that, that's good from local news. I mean, of course, it's playoff time. This is the best team in the state, but you need to see that attention for, to the team and not talking about Broncos all week long. But with that Kadri eight games, that that's a downside of the dominance that you're seeing from the avalanche right now, right? I mean, they're already up 3 nothing. It's looking like there's a good chance it's 4 nothing. So that means... Kadri still has six games if they only have two left against St. Louis. So that's the what, or I guess it would have been the conference finals. I don't know what they're calling it this year. Let's just say the semifinals, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's a long time for Kadri to be out watching his team, right? I mean, the battle that you want to be a part of with your, with your teammates, I mean, that's the toughest part, I think, for him, right? Plus, you know, there's a benefit. If the Avs can sweep the Blues in four games, they get a lot of rest, and that's awesome for them. You know, Get everybody healed up, get some practices in, because some of these other series may go longer. We don't know about the Vegas one, but it's at least going to go one game longer, right? But uh, on the other hand, if you win in four games, you have you know, however many games the suspension ends up being left for Kadri sitting out. You almost Which want this series to kind of go a little bit longer right. because he's somebody that you'd really need in a game, a series against Vegas. Exactly, exactly. And if they sweep him, then he, he still has six games to go, and that's, uh, that's a long time. But, yeah, uh, I guess it's time to hit a break. We'll get a little bit more into Avs games one, two, and three next with John Forslund and then Mark Moser after that. So stick around through the break right here on the Hockey Show, Mile High Sports. 89.98.1. Son of a gun. Told you I was playing guilty. I'm doing my best. 1075 HD3. Don't forget you. Online at milehighsports.com. You get the replays on your favorite podcaster and YouTube. We're, we're making it through here. We'll be right back with John Forslin on the hockey show. Danny Bailey behind the glass. We'll be right back. Right now it's 16 minutes past the big hour. Is that not right, Mr. Scream? <laughs> Great, good stuff. I think people are getting really cranked. Welcome back in Colorado's biggest and best live hockey radio show right here on My High Sports. It's the hockey show. We're going to the phones on the man advantage. Power play number one. We've got John Forslund, play-by-play broadcaster of the Seattle Kraken and NHL on NBC. I'm excited to see what he gets taken care of with the Kraken. But, of course, right now he's the one calling all the Avs Blues games. So let's get into that with John, John, thanks for joining us uh, with JJ and Ryan here. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Absolutely, I'm my pleasure. Absolutely. So you have a really non-biased opinion here, which is great. I'm excited to see that we got a little bit of a biased one since we are here in Colorado. But I guess you know we've seen the St. Louis Blues really fight, scratch and claw. They just can't seem to get anything done against the talent of Colorado. I guess what are you seeing in this matchup so far in that respect? Well, you know, I think all-out talent will override most things, you know, in a playoff series, and there's no question the Avalanche have the, the edge there. But I think the most overwhelming aspect of their game is their overall speed and how quickly they play and how quickly they move the puck up the ice from their defense, and it's really a non-existent forecheck right now for the Blues. If they can't choke off their defensemen, you know, on the way out, then you're really not going to limit any time and space in, in the neutral zone. And, and that, to me, is where Colorado cranks it up. I mean, they get, they get tremendous uh, speed through the middle of the ice. They get uh, the ability to uh, you know, set up in the zone, go on the attack. So it's a 200-foot scenario, and I, and I don't think uh, St. Louis has figured out that answer. Now, they've, they've been better, uh, you know, fits and starts and here and there, you know, within the, within the two, three games. But just not enough. So basically, I think what they're going to have to rely on is a break or two. They're going to have to rely on a power play. They're going to have to rely on over-the-top goaltending from Bennington. Uh, and he's been good, but he hasn't been exceptional. And he's almost going to have to be, you know, letter tight now to, to, to get it done. So it's insurmountable as far as I'm concerned. I think Colorado just has to play their game tomorrow. And a sweep, I think, is very likely. John, I always say hockey is a game of mistakes. 
And it seems like, especially when it comes to playing against the Avalanche, you can't really afford to take many. We saw um, Miko Ratanen and Nathan McKinnon connect on a goal, I think, in game one where the coverage was blown on them. They are both wide open. We see uh, uh, things like Jordan Bennington coming out to play that puck and basically spotting the Avs a goal in what was arguably their best game last night. Um, Do you think, you know, with the pressure of the, the series on the line for the Blues that this is something that they're they're going to be able to maybe recover from? I don't know if they can recover. They might recover for one game. Um, I wouldn't put it past them. I mean, they, they have a championship pedigree. They have a tremendous character in that locker room. Um, O'Reilly's had an okay series. Uh, probably for him it's not what he would like. Um, you know, but it, it isn't a situation of a, a lone ranger. And, and I think, you know, David Perron not being uh, available – you know, on the COVID list, that's been that's been costly for St. Louis in terms of scoring. You know, a natural finisher, which they could use to complement their lineup. You know, at, right from the outset of Game One, when Braden Shen was throwing those thunderous hits until Landeskog decided to take matters into his own hands. You know, you could see that they wanted to play a thump style. They wanted to try and uh, get to the Avalanche that way. Um, that never usually works in hockey. You know, if you can skate, move the puck, and you have a ton of talent. Um, you're, you're usually going to be successful if the other team tries to run you. So um, I just think that St. Louis will be way better. Um, I'm just worried about their lineup. I'm worried about, you know, the hits they've taken on defense, and those are very important players that are out of their lineup. They, they would need everyone on board to uh, have a chance to, to upset the avalanche, and it just doesn't look like they have that. I want to get into Ryan O'Reilly a little bit uh, there. You mentioned him. He's a minus six so far in the series, and I think he was a minus six in the first two games there. So obviously having a tough go for him, but do you put that onus more on Ryan O'Reilly, or is it just simply the talent of the Avalanche that he's unable to, I guess, defend here? Uh, To me, he looks like a player that's that's zapped with his energy, okay? I I just think he's gassed, and and I I think he's trying real hard. And, and again, he needs help. And, and I think when your, your checking assignment is uh, Nathan McKinnon, mm-hmm. uh, good luck. Good luck to anybody in the National Hockey League and that line. So, you know, usually when we talk about matchups, you know, it's not necessarily center on center. It's defense pairing, number one defense pairing on number one line. And now the number one defense pairing, which was Justin Falk and Tory Krug, um, it's been dismantled because of Falk's injury. So uh, that's a tough one there. And so not the, the entire onus cannot go on O'Reilly. But look at the situations they put him in. Um, I, I believe in, in game two, there were 56 face-offs in the game. O'Reilly took 44. Oh. Um, so, I mean, that's just a lot of workload, and he's had a long season. And, you know, maybe maybe he can find another gear. But to me, as an independent observer, I just see a player that's, uh, that's exhausted right now and exhausted in his role in the series. And, again, against the speed and talent of the Avalanche, it could become overwhelming. John, we were talking before the uh, break here about Nazem Kadri's hit in the subsequent yeah. suspension that followed it. And I'm curious just your thoughts on the play in general. I thought it, you know, maybe not as much malicious intent, but maybe a little circumstance of the, the play. Um, and then I was surprised by the amount of games that he got. So was I. I mean, I'm going with my initial thought, which is, you know, right after the game, we had a conversation independently about this, and they asked me, and I said, I think he'll get two games, maybe three. I think three games of a playoff series, if you want to go to four, that's pretty significant. You're basically going to take a player out of a series. Uh, So, you know, an eight-game suspension is pretty substantial in the regular season, is it not? If there's an eight-game suspension and an 82-game schedule, we're talking about a a, a major one. Uh, And now it's an eight-game suspension in the playoffs. So this will dip into this series. It could dip into the next series. I don't know if that's fair. It's a suspendable hit. There's no question about it. Based on the rules and based on the logic of the rules and everything and and the review process, there's no question. I believe he was backtracking. I believe it was not entirely malicious. But I think what we're running into in the NHL today, and it's very unfortunate, is striking the balance and finding consistency with all of these rulings. I can't figure it out. I've been in the game over 35 years. I, I can't figure it out. Um, and, I, and I think that's where we're running into trouble here because, yes, he's a repeat, repeat offender, um, but it almost seems like based on other things that have happened this year, they almost said we have to do something with this one, and that's not fair to Nazem Kadri. So, uh, yes, he should be suspended. I think it should be at the most three games. That's what I thought uh, and, and could have lived with two, but eight to me is over the top if you're asking my opinion. John, changing gears a little bit, I'm curious – 
as as somebody who frequently does multiple games very quickly with a quick turnaround series, a lot of travel, how do you prepare for, you know, kind of carrying the weight of two series, the Avs Blues and a lot of Pittsburgh and the Islanders? Yeah, and we started the Vegas-Minnesota series, right? So we started that one last Sunday, and I still have to keep my eye on it because I think we're going to tie it up in a bow at some point. So we might be on that series in six or seven if it goes that far, which is likely. So um, it's hard, um, and, and but it's a labor of love. I don't have a problem with that. The travel and the, the repetitious uh, nature of the scheduling cuts into your prep time. That's the only thing that's really arduous about this is that you don't have enough time to get the amount of prep that, that I feel I need to be really confident and comfortable going into a game. I get it done, but at the expense of fatigue. And, you know, and that's when, as a broadcaster, you know, you, you'll slip. You'll, 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 you'll get something wrong. You'll make a mistake. It's usually based on, you know, your, your rest and how fresh you are. So the first round is, is uh, a little bit different this year, too, because it's a mixed bag for us. We're in the arena. We're also in the studios in Stanford. Um, and, and calling the game off monitors is, is not a lot of fun. It's not the way to do it. It should never happen in a playoff game, but it is because of COVID and, and the situation we're in right now. Second round, once the locals are done, I think we're going to be exclusively in the buildings, and that'll be really good, and I think the crowds will continue to grow. And maybe by the end of this, we'll be almost back to normal. At least the appearance of that will be present. That will be good. But that, that to me, is the, is the trick. And the other thing, too, in a playoff series, is that as a national broadcaster, don't kid yourself. There's absolutely no way you can know every single thing about both teams. You're not even going to come close to where the, at the local level. And the fans are used to their local broadcasters, and they're used to getting that slanted approach in each market, which is really good. You've got a great crew there in Colorado. And, uh, and, and as a national guy, you just want to make sure you have enough information that you carry it through properly for both sides. And don't try to think you can you have it all because you don't. Just keep it simple in a playoff game. Let the game uh, dictate the emotion. Let the game dictate all of the stories. And that's the beauty of a playoff game. It's really face-off to face-off, shift to shift, and scoring chance to scoring chance. That's all it is. Everything else would happen in the regular season, any kind of you know storylines you want to throw out there. It's, it's a little bit of fluff. But in a real playoff game, it's all about shift after shift and what happens on the ice. This is the Hockey Show with J.J. and Ryan. We're talking to John Forzen of NBC Sports. John, along with that, tailing on the preparation question, of course, as you said, you've now kind of prepared and done your homework on six teams so far in the playoffs. Going into this season, the avalanche depth was really one of the biggest things. Now, comparing all those six teams you've kind of done your homework on and maybe even other ones that you've seen around the playoffs, how does this avalanche depth compare and, I guess, is it ready? Is it equipped to make the full run here to the finals? I believe so. I, I believe so. And I I thought that way during the regular season. I had them quite a bit. Um, I've seen this coming over the last couple of years. Uh, I think they're ready to make that step. I think, they, I, I, I think they're going to be able to do it. Um, and they would be my pick. They were one of my picks for uh, the Stanley Cup final at least. Uh, at the start of the season, and I usually don't renege on this unless I'm completely wrong. And so Colorado and Tampa Bay were the two teams that I picked, and I still believe that Colorado is the best team that I've seen so far. And I've covered Vegas, I think, four times this year, and they're right there with them. Um, it's going to be – if they do play in the second round, it's unfortunate it has to be in the second round, but that's the way it is. Um, but the, the Avalanche are a great team that's that really well coached, too. I think that's the other thing about their game. There's so much attention on the McKinnon line. There's so much attention on offensive numbers and how they do things. But you look at their shot suppression, you look at their defensive metrics all year, and you look at Bednar's coaching. Um, this guy is, I believe, a really good coach that deserves more credit than he gets. Um, and, and I just think that the back end plays today's game. They move the puck better than most. They they create everything off of off their defensemen. And they're proving that, you know, if you want to get in the trenches, they can take it. They can take a punch and give one back. And they have players that can do that. And there are guys on the sidelines right now that can come in and get healthier, but guys that are healthy that can come in and give them a contribution, uh, both on defense and up front. And you need that to go deep because you're going to have that war of attrition at some point. John, I want to ask you about a team that nobody knows anything about, and that's the official 32nd team of the NHL, the Seattle Kraken. And what do you anticipate uh, this transition to be like and being there for the the inception of a, a new NHL franchise like this? 
Well, I'm really excited and um, getting, you know, antsy to get there and, and to see it all. And I think as we get into July and you get into the expansion draft and you get into, you know, situations like that, you're going to you're going to be able to see, you know, more and more excitement build. So that's basically what what I'm looking at. And, uh, you know, right now it's still the great unknown. You know, I haven't been there. Uh, I haven't been to the city yet. Uh, obviously, went through a, a really extensive uh, selection process with them, which you know, I'm thankful for. And in my career, I, I get an opportunity to, to do this twice. Uh, I was able to mark time for 24 years with the Carolina Hurricanes and do it from day one, moving with the team from Hartford to Raleigh, watching that situation grow. And then at this stage of my career, to get the second chance at it, not many guys that do what I do get that opportunity. So I'm really thankful that this happened. Um, I was very surprised when things kind of broke down in Raleigh, but they did. And uh, another door opened for me. And I can't wait to get there. And I'll tell you what, I know that it's going to be an unbelievable experience. The building is going to be second to none. Uh, the, the organization has done some uh, groundbreaking things with, with their direction and the messaging they're kind of sending out uh, to, to the public. And then it's up to Ron, who I know very well, Ron Francis, to uh, put the pieces in place. And, and I know he will be. I know he'll be meticulous, well thought out, uh, everything he did in, in Raleigh. Because if you look at that hurricane lineup right now, that is a contender for the Stanley Cup. Uh, you know, his handprints are all over it. I mean, you know, yes, they've made a couple of moves with a new owner and the, the management team they have now, but basically the drafting and developing of most of that roster is all about Ron Francis. So I expect some great things. Awesome, John. Well, thanks for hanging out with us and uh, ch- chatting some Avs Blues here and enjoy the rest of the series and, uh, of course, the rest of the playoffs. Okay, Ryan. Thanks so much. Good luck to you guys. Anytime. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. There you have it. John Forslin, NBC Sports, another big name. He thought I was Ryan. I can't blame him. You asked uh, some good questions, so. Hey, thanks. They, they just came to me. I know I'm, I'm not on my A game today up here mentally, but those questions, I like them too. So stick around. We'll be right back, and we're going to talk to Mark Mosier, a little more local, probably a little bit more biased, but that's okay. That's what we're here for. Let's pump the abs tires. They're doing great. So we'll be right back on the hockey show. Stick around for Mark Mosier, JJ, Ryan, Danny Bailey behind the glass. Welcome back in. It's the hockey show. Right here on my high sports where we talk all things hockey in the middle of the NHL playoffs. I love it. Can't wait to get back to sitting on my couch and watching it. I can't believe you're talking over Eddie Van Hillen. What am I just supposed to sit here and turn into just a Just let your face melt at the awesomeness. But we're, we're a talk radio sh- station, not a music station. I think there's copyright laws. D- Danny's on the phone, so he can't get our back legally again like he did earlier in the show. But we're heading to the phones. We got Mark Mosier again uh, joining us here on Power Play 2. We got the main advantage again. So let's head right to it and get to him and, uh, you know, talk to him. Mark, you there? Hey, guys. How are you doing today? Fantastic. How about yourself? Doing some good. I love some little uh, eruption there. Let's like, write that up. That sounds good. We, yeah, we knew, we knew that would uh, be something you like, so we specifically <laughs> put that on for you. I'm in. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, weird. Ryan's mic uh, just went out, so I guess I'll keep talking here. But Moj, thanks for hanging out with us. Let's get into the Avs Blues series. I mean, you look at that three-game set so far, and you've got a three-goal game, a three-goal game, and a four-goal game. Did you expect this big of a discrepancy between the two teams going into this series? You know, I really did not, JJ. Honestly, it's you know the Blues were playing their best hockey coming down the stretch, and I, and I'd been impressed with some of the quality wins that they had had. You know, and, and again, the last two games of the season, I know the Avs were 5-1 and one against St. Louis until the last two meetings and then came out 5-3. and three. So I thought to myself, you know, the Blues are, are sort of peaking at the right time. Jordan Bennington had been playing just splendidly between the pipes, and, and I don't think he's been bad this series at all. But, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things you get to the postseason and you can really tell differences, right, and you really understand – you know, which team is determined, which team feels like it has the firepower, the belief inside of itself. And not that the Blues didn't, but they've been really overwhelmed at times by this Colorado Avalanche squad. I think we saw in the first two games, I mean, the top line is just flat-out dominant, Kale McCarr doing Kale McCarr things. And then when you get to game three, you have four guys who score their first goal of the series, and then another guy who scores his second goal of the series in Brandon Sod and it just shows really how deep this Avs squad is, and, and that's what the Avs have been trying to build for, for a couple, four years now, trying to get the core together, and they knew what it was, 
and then put the proper pieces around that core. And right now they're able to show it off against the Blues team, again, that, that had no answer for the Avs' top line. But once you get that going, it's tough to stop everything else. Mosher, is this a prime example of what the Avs have been trying to get away from, which is being sort of labeled that one-line team, the McKinnon, Rantanen, Landeskog, is their only firepower kind of concept? Yeah, right. I think you look a couple, three years ago, even four years ago against Nashville, and, you know, the, the top line had to do a lot of heavy lifting, and and rightfully so. I mean, they're the guys who are, are expected to lead the way. They're the guys who, you know, that, that everybody's going to count on, but you're, you're going to – you're going to have to have more than that. I mean, listen, when you send O'Reilly and Pareko out and the entire idea is, okay, let's hammer Grant in, let's hammer McKinnon, let's, let's get these guys from the get-go. I mean, we saw it last night. Shen had the first minor of the game. That's because Miko was standing on the dot after delivering a pass and Shen blew him up. Well, when, when you start to focus on those guys, then, then other guys can take over, and it hasn't always been that way. And so you start to do the deals. You start to, you know, bring in a Burakovsky on a deal. You know, you, you get a Don Skoy as a free agent. You, you, re, you, know, you sign Val to, an, you know, to a, a, a re, basically what was a sort of a PTO, and then he earns another deal. You acquire a Belmar. You get all these proper pieces where everything seems to fit. You put the puzzle together. On the back end as well, you, you make some proper additions to, to guard against an injury like the one we saw to Eric Johnson. And I think the Avs have done a really good job piecing things together. You know, I was talking to Pierre Maguire yesterday, and he said, when we did a deal with Philly back in the day in 91 for Pittsburgh, he said, it looked like we lost the deal in terms of on paper, but we got the right guys that needed to fit into what the Penguins lineup already was. And then, of course, they went on to win the Cup. And, and you, so you, you, it's not just that you get this talent. You've got to get the right pieces. And Gabe Landeskog even reiterated that. He said, look, it's to the point now where when guys come into this squad, they either have to be bought in as to what we do and how we do it, or they're gone. They will not last. They're going to be gone from this team. And so you see not only guys coming in and fitting in, but the younger guys going into to those roles like a, like a Tyson Jost has here, certainly like a, a Sammy Gerrard has, and, and even guys like J.T. Comper, they fit in. And so right now it just it looks, it looks very – put together with where this team should be. I would say another thing that I wasn't expecting from this series is the physical side of this Avs team, their unwillingness to get pushed around. I mean, you go back to even the last year's playoffs, and it feels like Dallas really kind of out physical them, and that was kind of their, their downfall. Is that another thing you weren't expecting, or what's changed that suddenly this team does not get pushed around? Well, I think that, you know, it, 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 I think people think sometimes – that you have to have big size and big hulking bodies in order to not get pushed around. You know, I mean, Matt Calvert, and, and I wish he was in there, I wish he was healthy, but Matt Calvert is not a big guy. But Matt Calvert is afraid of no man or no animal, period. And, uh, you know, it, it's more of a mindset than anything else. And I think you look at the captain and you look at what he did in game number one and – my goodness gracious. I mean, he, he set a tone, I think, for, you know, for what this series is going to be right off the bat. I mean, to me, when he goes after Shen and tunes him up like that, it basically is saying, listen, we'll take hits, we'll absorb hits, we'll get smoked, fine, we'll smoke you back, but we're not going to take crap. And, you know, that's the mindset of this, this club. And, I, again, I look at Nico Rantanen, you know, coming down the stretch, teams really got in his kitchen a lot. And it may have bothered him a little bit, and he seemed to, to get off his game a little bit. Well, they tried to blow him up last night, and what I noticed about this ab squad, well, forget about the cadre thing for now, but whistle to whistle, they're not getting involved in a lot of crap, guys. They it, Listen, Miko got punched in the head and knocked down. He stood up, stared at the guy, stood his ground, and then said, is that all you got? And then you go away, because that's what it takes to win in the Stanley Cup playoffs. So, J.D., I think it's it's a matter of, we're just not going to take it. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll absorb hits because we know we're going to get hit a lot. But we're going to keep on playing. And it's just more of a mindset, I think, than anything else. I got I can't get over that play, Moj, last night when Jordan Bennington comes out to play that puck and just gives Ryan Graves a, a little chip and goal there. Do you, is that the turning point in what was probably the Blues' best game of the series? I think it, I think it, it has to be. You know, again, the Avs held off the Blues in their best shot, I thought, in game number two. 
And and I'm not saying that it you know it it it, it causes a team to you know to not believe in themselves. But I mean, listen, they 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 took the the Blues' best shot in that comeback when Blaze scores and then the five minute major. The Avs only give up one, but they managed to survive. And, you know, you look at Grubauer. He never gave up that game-tying goal, which was a huge key. And, you know, it's just it's, – it's amazing to me to see how things turn. And when you have a Bennington, he's trying to make something happen for his team. And we know it's a gamble. I mean, I'm not sure that Ryan Graves is going to score on a breakaway. You know, but, but Bennington wants to come on out, and he's kind of a, the kind of guy who's going to – you know, he's going to, to – how can I put it? Maybe take be your legs bit, out. <laughs> yeah, we no. You know, he's going to be a guy that's going to wander a little bit. You know, he's going to be involved in that direction. And uh, heck, man, uh, it was it was a gamble play. And Ryan Graves, I got to give him a tremendous amount of credit. This guy came charging out of the box, and it was a really heads up play uh, it, all the way around. And you know, Bennington even got a piece of it. But holy cow, you know, Graves made it stick and. It was a huge uplift for that Avalanche squad. And I think, I don't want to say it broke Blue's backs because they still continued to play. But boy, it was a, I think it was a tough thing for them to stomach a little bit because they had it 0 0, you know. And even if, if it becomes a one goal game, you know the abs are coming and you know they're going to be coming. And then you see Newhook get his first, and they just have so many weapons to beat you. I just think it took a, a little bit of wind out of their sails on that gamble that Bennington did and did not win. With Newhook's goal, it kind of seemed like he really stepped up in the cadre absence, right? And last time I saw you, you and I were in the press box, and that was kind of the buzz in Ball Arena was the the looming cadre suspension. So now that we've heard the eight games, what do you think about that? And then second parter with Newhook and Soderberg stepping in, how did they handle the uh, the gap there with cadre missing? Yeah, it's 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 probably with, with I know people say, well, the eighteen months, you know, he's not a repeat offender, but the league has the option to look at everything. Now, I, I will not condone the hit at all. I, I don't, you know me, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that kind of hit. I'm not a fan of that kind of play. And so the league's going to look at it. When you hit a guy in the head, no matter what, you're going to be looked at. And because he's got a history of that, he's going to be looked at through more of a magnifying glass than anybody else. I honestly think, guys, and, and, I, and I could be wrong in this, it was maybe, you know, the, the league trying to send a message because I know that they were not happy after Tom Wilson was not suspended against the Rangers and the gong show that occurred in the very next game. I know the league was not happy about that. I know that they, uh, that they were, you know, they wanted to temper some things down. So I think it looks like they said, all right, enough of this. We're going to sit him down for quite a while and the abs will have to live with it. They will. But you know what? I thought that, you throw J.T. Comper up there, and here's what's cool about a guy like Comper and a guy like Jost. You don't want to take Jost off with Nachushkin and Saad because they've got something cooking right now. But, but at the same time, J.T. Comper has played in the middle. You know, he's been playing wing, but he's played in the middle, and he can step into that role. And, and he knows what to do. He's not a kid anymore. He's not a baby anymore. He's a veteran in the National Hockey League. And, of course, we know Carl, what you're going to get out of Carl you know, big, thick body. And by the way, his hit on O'Reilly in that third period was a, I thought a big take the win out of the sales hit. Mm-hmm. You know, O'Reilly's coming through the neutral zone and Carl gives him a big hip check. And I never want to see anybody get hurt. And thank goodness O'Reilly wasn't. But he did sort of, you know, he was slow motion back to the bench. And that's what Carl Soderberg can bring. He's a bigger guy, I think, than people realize. He's a thicker dude than people realize. And he brings a ton of momentum. And so I thought that uh, that Carl came in and stepped in quite nicely, and I thought that JT did a nice job. And if you ask Carl about it, he'll say, yeah, I came across and I hit him. And, <laughs> yeah, and that's that. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Uh, Carl is, is such a – God, he's a unique and great dude, man. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm glad to have that guy back on the abs because – and it's too bad, Ryan, because we're not allowed to, you know, to go in the room anymore, JJ, because of the protocols – but I just love to sit and talk with Carl, you know, and, and uh, talk about life in the world. And he's a very interesting guy. Yeah, he's definitely a guy that isn't isn't a all about me type of person when the camera's rolling. But he's happy to talk to you about things that he's interested in. 
Oh, for sure. Absolutely. Moj, we had John Forslund on before you, and one of the things we talked to him about was calling games and travel and how that's that's changed given the current COVID protocol situation. But you and I have talked about it a little bit too. Just how hard is it to, to bring energy and, and call games when you're not in the building kind of feeding off of what the crowd's got going? It's difficult, Ryan. It is for me anyway. Um, you know, I, I put it this way. It, it, I'm glad to be calling games. I'm just I'm happy as a clam that we're able to do it. Hell, I'm I'm super happy that we have a dang season. But it makes it difficult, and, and it, it's the way that that all the television transmissions are set up this year. You know, the Blues guys did not come to Colorado. We are not going to to St. Louis. I, I don't know that anybody has traveled unless it's sort of a. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a drive like from you know, heck, I don't even know. Uh, it, it really, it, it's just all set up differently this year, the way the signals get out, how the signals are taken by the national feed, by the opposing team's feed. And so it really is impossible to travel to the location because all your personnel, your director and your producer, everybody has to be back in the home city. But, you know, we're lucky enough that we've got three screens. One has the play, you know, the, the following the puck. One is a wider shot. One is a camera that we control so we can look at the bench and all of that, but it's not like being there because, you know, Peter McNabb, as you guys know, he's truly one of the best analysts and knowers of hockey I've ever seen in my entire life. And he looks at so many different things that aren't where the puck is. You know, and on TV, you see where the puck is and a little, and, and a little bit more. But he's looking at everything else. He's looking at how guys position themselves at the blue line. Where do they go? How do they come back in? What are they seeing? And, you know, that's what makes him so great because he, he sees everything about the game so well. So it's been a little bit easier on me because I'm following the puck most of the time, even though, you know, there'll be a whistle and you have no idea why. Well, there's a, there's a, a you know, penalty taken behind the play, and you don't know because you're at the, the beck and call of the referees and, and what's on the little tiny screen, and, uh, you know, and you're at, the, you're at the mercy of the opponent's feed if, if they're in St. Louis. So we take the feed from St. Louis, their raw feed, and we try to figure out what's going on. So it, it does make it more difficult. It's not ideal, but it's, uh, it's the way to get through it. And, you know, for Fours, he's calling a bunch of different series. So maybe it makes it okay because, you know, he's in one spot all the time. He can do a bunch of different teams. But I know that he would rather be at the rink. And not only that, but talking to the guys, getting inside dope, you know, that we would normally get. To, to pass along to the viewer and let them really understand what the team is about and what's going on and little nuances. So it's not ideal, but, you know, we do the very best we can, and we just keep on plodding through. Moj, I'm playing a little guilty today. I was in the firefighter tournament yesterday, so naturally there's going to be some whiskey there. But as a whiskey guy yourself, I'm just kind of wondering, what's your fla flavor of the month right now? You guys, I uh, have been on, and the Bears not going to like me saying this, but I like... You know, Stranahan's, I, I got to support the home city, and I got to support Stranahan's. And, you know, I like the, 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 the yellow label, the standard. Uh, I've got some, some special bottles that my brother-in-law gave me. But they have this one, it's called the Solera Finish. It's the, it's, the blue, it's the blue label. And it's cheaper, and it's so good. It tastes like kettle corn with a finish. I like to have a little sippy sip and relax a little bit. I'm telling you guys, you can't go wrong, so... If you want to pick up a bottle, you know, this is completely unendorsed, a bottle of the Stranahan's Blue. That's where I'm at. Sold. <laughs> right on. Right on. Dude. Right on, dudes. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks, man. Absolutely. Thank you. There you have it. D. Mark Mosier. Man, he's just, he's the greatest. I love Mosier. The other day I heard uh, Birdo, right, one of the other altitude guys, call McGahey the Han Solo of hockey. I wonder what he calls Mosier because... He's got to be a little bit cooler than Han Solo, right? Chewbacca? The Chewbacca. The, the Boba Fett of hockey. Boba Fett. <laughs> All right, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be right back to wrap up the show. This is the Hockey Show on My High Sports. I play hockey and I fornicate because it's the two most fun things in cold weather. Welcome back to the Hockey Show. I like to do those two things. It's too. warm. <laughs> it's not cold. Hey, it's still a great time to play hockey and 
do the other thing. But obviously, short on time, so let's get to a quick rapid fire here. A couple things still to talk about. Last night, we saw two of our old friends, not one, but two, win games in overtime, both Matt Duchesne and Paul Stasny, I guess. How does it feel watching, uh, you know, like your ex-girlfriends, right? It's like watching your ex-players, guys we knew, guys we liked for a while, um, just getting their teams through overtime. You know, I think it was a night for the Avalanche and the former Avalanche, and I'm happy for guys like that who have success. I I think uh, Matt Duchesne soured his relationship with a lot of people the way he left town. I think Paul Stastny did also by kind of walking away for, you know, home. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm still happy for the guys. Technically, Paul Stastny and I went to college together, so I'm always happy to see him achieve. Uh, And it was a, a bit of a laser. And then I thought Matt Duchesne's goal was filthy in overtime. Like, it was sick. One thing I don't miss that I, I was watching that Carolina-Nashville game and you just saw Matt Duchesne being a crybaby a lot to the refs and whining and, you know, just yelling at him. And that's one thing I do remember about him that I, I don't miss. I mean, Miko Rantanen has been a, a, a wild like, card does lately. He, does I'm he not whine saying he's whiny. I'm just saying he's been a wild card lately. John Tavares, what do you think? That was ugly. I mean, yeah, it's weird to see, uh, you know, because it didn't seem like that crazy of a hit and the way he went down as the athletic trader trying to help him. I mean, obviously, good news coming out of Toronto on that front. But the hit itself, I mean, we're we're seeing a lot of this right now, right? I mean, with Falk, Tavares and uh, around the league, we got to figure out how to protect hockey players heads better somehow here in the my near first future. reaction was of course it's Corey perry that hits him in the head with his knee and it you could watch it a hundred times and it mostly looks unintentional he's trying to avoid him you know maybe not that hard but i know Corey perry stood up to the bell he took the fight he kind of ragdolled and let them throw some punches into his face and then the game moved forward you know but i was just like what a Corey perry you know, adjacent accident to happen to Tom Tavares. Well, that was the other, okay. How dumb was it that he had to answer the bell and get in a fight for an accidental, yeah. you know? Yeah. You think you, you're okay with it's it? It's Corey Perry. Uh, Latvia beat Canada at the world championship. Who cares? Host nation. I know that's <laughs> the kind of tough thing. If your team's in the playoffs, you don't care about the world championship. And if your team's not in the playoffs, then you care about every single game. But, you know, for, well, for it, the, the, the country that invented hockey, quote unquote, to lose to the host nation, it's, you know. They're not sending pros this year, right? They're sending you There's pros. 21s, U18, something like that. There's guys. Cal Peterson and guys are playing down there. Oh. All right. Yeah. Well, that's all we really have for today, right? Zoom. What do you think about Zoom? Do you think we're ever going to get back in the locker room? Yeah, eventually. Not this season. I think it's time. If, I, I don't, I don't if think buildings can be full... If uh, if uh, players can go out to restaurants and eat dinner together because they're vaccinated, why can't vaccinated media members be in the, uh, let's say, an interview room, not the dressing room, an interview room? I think, yeah. I, I, I think they're just going to ride it out. The players obviously don't like media, and they're just going to finish this season and maybe uh, circle back before next season. But that'll do it for this week's edition of the Hockey Show. We'll be back, probably talk more playoff hockey next week. Um, I'm probably going to try to lay off the whiskey next Friday. So thanks for hanging out with us. For Ryan, I'm JJ. See you later.